Hey guys, welcome, welcome. Another great show. Um, we're here. That shout outs to Sean Ware, Jamid Billingsley, and Je Mr. Jesse Lopez. Still at port. Welcome, guys. How are you guys doing today? What's up? What's up? We good? We good. Excited for well? round two. What's doing going great. On? This is part two. You guys love part one so much. We decided to come <laughs> come up with a part two to address some of these topics. I know um, we had some on TikTok, Facebook, and LinkedIn about some of our topics. You know, we had some traveler issues. Um, <laughs> shout out to Sean. Um, we're going to be covering some new topics today. So um, we'll be right back after our intro. If I could find it. <laughs> Five, four, three two one I'm not going to go in at anybody for comments they made on the previous show. Um, so, I will start, <laughs> so I will, we'll start fresh. We'll start with some new topics. Um, Jameed, Jameed had a topic. We're going, we're going to go with Jameed this time. So we're going oh, to see boy. succession planning, right? So we, we have had, we have had issues in the past. I, I maybe that's not a topic to start with right now. Cause I just heard some news. Um, so managers, leaving or leadership leaving a department and um not making preparations for the new person or the younger generation or the next generation to come in um how do you guys feel about that like after that person who's been there getting ready for retirement leaves there is no one within the facility within the health system or that, that immediate vicinity there to step up to take that role um, how do you guys feel about it? Well, <laughs> I, I, I'll jump in on this one real quick. <laughs> it, it this that that one is um, it's a touch and go subject for me, um, only because leadership styles change. So um, I know when an old leader is about to leave and a new leader is about to take over, there are some basic things that we need to learn, like access to different um, servers and you know, contact information. But aside from that, I mean, how does one step into the role of a previous leader when most leaders come in with a whole different output or outlook on how their department's going to be ran or what they want to implement? So it, it it's like, to me, um, when I stepped into a leadership role in my previous uh, facility, I went from technician to assistant manager right off the back. I was never a lead, a supervisor or anything like that. I did have managerial skills, but there was no one there to mentor me to go into that role. It was an open position. No one was there previous. Um, so when I jumped into that role, it was basically working with the director, trying to figure out, you know, what access do I have? Where do I go? But my managerial experience from the past was already kicking in as to, I know sterile processing, I'm a technician going forward. What are some of the issues that I know I can tackle without getting too political? So when you go into that, into that succession role, it's what can possibly get taught, you know, okay, here's what I left on the table, but that manager has already built such a big reputation probably in that facility that when a new manager tries to either take over that role or implement their own it's like hitting a wall so the respect has to come later on so i feel kind of like torn in between where it's like okay are you gonna let me shine or is it do i gotta prove myself to you first i can re i can agree with jesse on that to an extent um the part that i say extent to is uh any situation in my career where i was leaving and new managers came on board 
and I had everything drafted off of projects, the schedule, contacts for all the suppliers, contacts for all the machines, and uh, you know, the person coming in didn't want nothing to do with that. Uh, I, I kindly said okay, um, gave him a, a severe notice. It wasn't no two weeks, four weeks notice. It was longer than that, uh, which is above and beyond. Unfortunately, uh, you know, the first six months to a couple years, uh, they still reached out and they said, hey, uh, we need this contact, we need this supplier, how'd you do this, how'd you do that? And, you know, it, it stinks when you had it happen to you. Um, you try and help the new manager succeed in their role, and they don't want to take that, that, that collaborative effort to, uh, you know, get the information they need before you leave. But Sean, it, it sounds like you did a good job of, of succession planning. So I'm, I can address both of you guys' side of it because Jesse, you're right. When you start talking about management styles and, and goals for the department, that's separate than succession planning. The, let's think about it from a technician perspective. You're not gonna hire a technician in and not have a competency that says, here's, you need to learn how to do this. And then now here's how you success. Here's the milestone that you uh, successfully completed that. And the biggest thing that we can do as as not just managers, whether you're a supervisor, hell, even a team lead, right? Uh, educator. What are all those things? Write down all those things that nobody taught you when you got the job, and say this is this is a part of the competency for this this position. Because people don't have competencies for anything other than text. So when I ask them, when I'm doing audits, so do you have a, a competency specific to your job? And they go, no, why would I have, we do the cop. So your job is the same as Charlie out there on the, on the, uh, on the table. So building those competencies, it, it, that's not going to be the same as telling them how to be a leader, growing them into being a leader. That's a different part of the success and training. But just starting off with something Jesse mentioned, here's all the systems you need to be able to access. Something Sean missing. Here's all the vendor contacts that you need to have. Just starting off with that and then developing it into, okay, when you talk about the political side, Jesse, part of that political side is you don't know who they know. So that means they did a terrible job of succession planning, right? Because we have to stop saying, oh, I've got a meeting at 12. No, if you have a succession plan, we've got a meeting at 12. We Here's what we're working on. And that's what with the succession plan, what happens is you share the contact. You share the core competencies. You share the access that they need to have. And then eventually that becomes you start sharing some of the connections. Oh, we have this infection prevention meeting. I've never been to an infection prevention meeting where, they, where they're id in. It's not like the club. It's not like the club. Like, whoa, 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 whoa. Who, who is this Sean guy? Oh, he's my first shift team lead. I'm just trying to trend. No. If you bring them, they can come. So part of that succession planning, and Harry says that in the, in the comments. You talked about somebody retiring, Bernard. Yeah. And let's be real. This is sterile processing. We know that our average, according to Warren Nist, the average stint as a leader of a sterile processing is going to be five to six years. So it ain't retirement is that why they're leading. So what I'm telling you, all the managers, educators, team leads, and supervisors, don't wait to is get you think you're ready to move to another hospital or whatever. Start now. Start now saying, oh yeah, you're gonna you're gonna talk at huddle today. Hey, I'm I'm doing the education plan. You're gonna give an in service. Let me show you how to record the stuff. So that when that opportunity comes, whether it's a positive, hopefully, or not so positive, realistically, then we already have a succession plan in place because we said, here's the stuff that I struggled with when I got here. I made it into a core competency and I said, you got to log on to the, the time card system and you got to check the time card system. You got to take these courses. So those are the kind of things to me that as a succession plan is not that you have to act like a manager. But making those connections, you're you're supposed to be the you're coming in to be the manager, and you only see the director of surgical services at at uh, at the Christmas party. No, nah, that's not that's not gonna cut it. So as you can tell, it's a passion. It's a, a topic I'm passionate about because 
the more the better your succession plan is, the less likely you're going to have to use it. So you're saying that, and and I agree with you on. I think I see where you're going with lead tech supervisors or managers, directors, and so forth. Up, right? They should have their own set of competencies for their job duties. Yeah, not not some long extensive list. Concentrate on the things that you do that's separate from the sterile processing um, competency. Like, <clears throat> what do I do different every day? What do I do different that if somebody had told me I had to do, I would have done a good job at it. Remember giving those first performance evals? I wish somebody had uh, told me, hey, remember, like, read this book about critical contacts and, and having professional conversations and how to handle it when somebody starts crying when they get their when they get their performance eval. So, you know, just those kind of things. That's what that's what I'm saying. Sean. So let me let me throw a wrench in that. So what if a manager it doesn't have anyone within the system who they could trust to take that next role? And um, the new person is coming in and they will have maybe two weeks to a month to to learn. What's what what would be the process for that? Well, at least you still have the, the list of, of the competencies that you're not going to get be able to get through in that short period of time. You have the list of contacts and vendor contacts. And then even in that short time, you can introduce them to those people they need to build those relationships with, whether it's infection prevention, whether it's the operating room, whether it's the ancillary clinics, whether it's the infection prevention meeting, whether it's the C-suite, depending on your position, you still are going to have time to make those introductions because the hardest thing is when you come in and then the way you find out that somebody is a key player politically, to Jesse's point, is that they they come down raging mad at a mistake you've made or they're complaining about your level of service and you don't even know who they are because nobody introduced you to them. Nobody told you, well, here at this hospital, Neuro has a lot of juice. Or here at this hospital, the ophthalmologists are really, you know, they're part of that. They're more important than at another hospital. Those are the kind of things that you can cover in a succession plan. And then when you're rushing to try to orient somebody, that's the worst time, Bernard, to try to remember all the stuff that you need to tell them. If you start writing it in a non-pressure situation, oh, yeah, ortho at this hospital is the king. And so you go to a place and you're like, oh, they have cardiac. Let me get with these cardiac surgeons. Those guys are nice as they're gentle as, as, as a, a hummingbird at this hospital. I wish somebody had told me that ENT is the biggest complaint of doctors and they listen to them in the C-suite. So just just kind of making a list of things that could help them out. And it's just like paying it forward, right? Because here's the secret thing. When you make your succession plan for this, this uh, organization that you're in now, when you go to your next organization and they haven't done a succession plan, guess what you already have? Your blueprint from that. Okay, let me see. Oh, I need to get access to this to your payroll system, which is different than the one I use, but the same the same tick points hit. So hmm. that it, 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 it it's you're helping the facility that you're in and the next leader, but you're also <laughs> helping yourself because now you have some guidance because you know. You, you wrote the succession plan, but then when you get into this new pressure situation, can you remember all the stuff from that? Or is it a file that you've saved that you said, this is what I think all managers, educators, whatever position you're leaving and going to the next one should know? Makes sense. Yeah, you make Makes a lot sense. of sense. Okay, so let me throw another wrench into that. So what if the person providing the those guidelines was unsuccessful themselves and what if they're leading that new person down the same path I, I could tell you what i think of as a succession planning has nothing to do with the success that they're going to have right the, what, what i'm thinking of as succession plan is here's the stuff you need access to here's the stuff you need to know here's the particulars that are particular to this system the water here is terrible so you always have to stay on top of the operation Listen, they may not have been able to successfully manage the department, but a succession plan is going to, no matter what your plan is or the next person's plan when they come in, though, that stuff on a succession plan is going to help them get off to a great start. It's just like it's just like orientation, right? All right. Because so if what? They got fired and they didn't complete their orientation. Doesn't mean the orientation is bad. So what would you tell someone coming in? 
to look for to look for in a bad plan to not follow <laughs> <laughs> so like okay so someone would, would write in hey don't speak to this department this department Ignore is that. bad yeah, this right. department is better the water quality is bad so mm -hmm. how do i pour, how do i figure out if i'm coming in that this is totally wrong that person looked at it from a t totally different perspective and i could actually talk to those surgeons i could actually there isn't a water problem it's a steam problem you know what i mean so how do i know that i'm walking into the right plan or should i just scratch that and start over with what i know well let me tell you what i would do i'm walking in the facility i don't want to hear what the old staff have to say about anybody else i could care less um because i'm gonna make my own judgment my own feelers uh maybe that staff was sm was doing bad Maybe they weren't precepted the right way. Maybe they weren't guided in the right direction to succeed. So I can take them and reevaluate them, re-educate them, and get them ready for success. Uh, the manager comes in, and you know they have those things like, "Oh, watch out for, uh, you know, Jesse over there. He's likes to stir the pot up. He talks too much. He's <laughs> you know what I mean?" I I but, but I'm gonna come in with a blind eye and say, "I don't care what the past was. We're starting fresh." We're starting new. I'm going to hear what y'all have to say. I'm going to watch you all work for a couple of weeks. And then I'm going to make my judgment call on saying, well, hey, maybe it actually was Denardo was the bad person, not Jesse. Maybe Jesse was right. And just the old manager had, you know, a blind eye to things that they wanted to, to see with. And, I did, and definitely, I think um, um, if, if I'm understanding it correct, that blueprint can carry over anywhere. So it's not really specific to a, a facility. It's specifically to a leadership role. So, I mean, it's just things that you should know as a leader that, honestly, I believe some leaders hold on to, like, you know, vendor contacts. I think that's something that I think that's something that all leadership should know, regardless of whether what facility you go into. Who's your vendors? Who are you dealing with? Do you just deal with a specific vendor? Your ortho, you know, when you go into this specific facility, you know, if you're an ortho heavy facility, who's that vendor you're dealing with? Are you dealing with every ortho vendor or you're just yeah. drinking with Sinti's? You know, but you should have that contact or that should be part of that plan as a, as a leadership group as to, hey, whatever facility you got, you should be having contacts for your vendors or your leaders should have that. You know, um, who's your CEOs, the CFOs, your nurse directors, who are the people that you're reporting out to? That's universal throughout everything. You know, who's your leads? Do you do you have leads on every on, on every shift? Do you have managers? How's your structure in your facility? That's part of that. I believe that succession plan and that blueprint. So when you're stepping into that role, the heck with the management style, the heck with the the heck with how the culture is in the facility. That becomes part of your leadership style. But the plan is this is this I have that succession is I have all my contacts. I know who my boss is. I know who his boss is. I know all the meetings I need to attend. I need. I know all the politics that are going on within this facility. Now I have to build my department. That's completely different from a succession plan. And I, I, I get it now. I agree. Yeah. And, so, and, <laughs> and to, to jump on, on that, I mean, Jesse, you hit if the succession plan includes negative stuff like like your curveball you threw, then that probably explains why that leader didn't succeed, right? Exactly. So the, exactly. The, 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 the main part of succession plan is information about this specific facility that yep. you may not know. And I, I see Harry talk about asking inter, inter, uh, questions during the interview. Sometimes the stuff you need to know is are not interview questions. Right. So I, what right. yep. APIs are you reporting? What's your turnover rate? What's the, you know, blah, 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 blah. So I think there's a, a balance there. And, and I, I think a good succession plan is keeping it as factual as possible and informational as possible. Telling people to watch out for these people and don't, that's that's not a succession plan. No, no, no. Nope, nope, that's, yeah, that's, that's, that's basically trying to implement their leadership style on you. Right. Everyone has their own. So yeah. you're, you're going to, just as Sean said, you're going to, 
you're going to have your own assessment. I mean, if, yep. if you're one of those leaders that's by the book or, you know, you're one of those leaders that like to interact, some leaders don't like to interact with people. It's your leadership style that determines the, the success of your facility or, or of your position. But that succession plan gives you the success to be able to implement that yep. leadership style. Much quicker, much quicker. Definitely. If you have, to, more if you have to learn all that stuff in regular, in real time, the worst thing is, you, I mean, what facilities do a poor job of is, hey, here's the meetings we need you you to attend. They do a, a job. Their job is, and, and and all of us have been around enough to know how it happens. Hey, Sean, are we, we're in the in the C suite. Are you coming? Am, am I? I'm looking at my calendar. I don't. Where, where's the C suite oh, at? That to you? Yeah, that's that's. That's probably, that's probably the worst feeling as being being in a leadership role right. and you have answers for nothing. It's like, oh, right. um, so uh, are you going to talk to, you know, such and such? And you're like, who the hell is that? Right. Uh, right. That's your boss? Uh, right. Really? Ooh, right. my bad. That's, that's the way they go. They're like, oh, Kathy was asking a question and you're like, my first week, who's Kathy? You know? <laughs> and, and, and so the, the when you do a, a good succession plan, it's just giving you basic information to prepare the next leader because, yeah. and here's how it helps you. It's Kathy at, at your hospital. When you get this new job as the AVP at this next hospital or director, or whatever you move to, you still need to know whoever Kathy is. Who, who is the director of nursing? Who is the infection control VP? You know, those are the, so you can, the names might change, but that stuff that you need to know doesn't change. And that's why I'm trying to convince people doing a succession plan is not only useful for your replacement, but it's useful for you when you go to your new place. I can say that I've been more successful figuring it out by myself, you know, yeah. how to do those first couple of weeks with the new hires, how to get them, you know, their ID badge, um, the scrub access and figure out meetings on the fly than having a list. But I have a different, you know, way of learning than some people, most people, that um, me figuring out myself, you know, someone can tell me, oh, yeah, this is how you do it, uh, and they walk away. Well, you did it. You didn't let me do it. Now I didn't learn. Uh, and also, you know, if they might be trying to tell you the wrong way, too, where it doesn't always work the right way or they know the back because they've been for 15 years, they always done it that way, which, you know. I can well, say in two years, it, things have changed in a year's time on how you do one thing anymore. And, and, and I get that, Sean, because you are a different cat. But <laughs> let's not confuse technical, complex things oh, yeah. with simple stuff. Yeah, that's yeah. ridiculous that you have to figure out how to get people their scrubs. Yeah, if there's an a, a email you need to send to say, change it all from Jessica Lopez to Sean Weir, you need to send that on the first day. And, and learning how to do that yourself is a huge waste of time and a waste of time that you could be getting to know your department. Mm -hmm. So I'll push back on, I, I know you you have that independent streak and all that stuff. Man, if you have a succession plan, and then you know when you come into your next place that I left my, the previous person, here's how you do it, then now you have better questions to ask when you get there. It's, mm -hmm. Asking how to get scrubs is not an interview question. That's not yeah. an interview question. And and and, and, oh, no. and, it's, and it's very important because it determines how the people that report to you look at you. Because right. if you look like, because if you look like you don't have no answers and have no clue, <laughs> they're gonna look at you like uh, this is my leader. Right. This guy right. don't know jack. <laughs> so regardless of how much wealth of knowledge you have, again, right. that goes to that point where you're left to kind of prove yourself to the individuals around you, which is should never do that. That should never right. be the I, factor. I, I that, it, that, this that, should be basically. Fire, I'm not going to help you out kind of thing. Yeah. I I, we're, we're, yep. Exactly. Yeah, I, I and then the reason we're talking about that this now is because it's actually an issue within our cell processing field. I've seen many managers go to new departments and have no idea where to start, where to finish, who to talk right. to, you know, and their their leadership team doesn't know uh doesn't have a clue either because they don't they don't come down to CSS or cell processing and they don't they don't have any idea what the run-ins are. So you basically have to start from scratch 
with all your processes, all your new, all your contacts. You might have to, you might have to call your old contacts to find out information at the, that at, at your facility because they used to work there or they know somebody that you need to get in contact with. So and that and that, and that's something I've done in the past as well. Like you know, I know, hey, oh, we got stairs equipment. I know my old stairs rep. Right, I don't know the one here. Right. Let me give a call. Yeah. But that's that's again, that's being, you know, that's putting your managerial skills to to. To the test it's like it, it are you able are you a critical thinker or are you one of the people that need to hand me out all the time if you're a manager who requires a hand me out all the time maybe you shouldn't be a manager or a leader you should have that critical thinking skill that say hey hey i see this piece of equipment i know my old rep maybe that's it and you might find out oh yeah we don't service that no more as a third right. party now i have to ask some questions yeah, and another yeah. tech to advice for techs, get to know if you have an in-service, get to know your reps. If the guy's coming to fix a sterilizer every two days, talk to him. Hey, what do you think is wrong? Right, you might get right. to learn something about sterilizers. You might get to learn something about the business either. You might end up and transitioning into a different field. Talk to you. Right, rep. right. I mean, mm -hmm. when you look at a lot of those guys started off as sterile processing techs who were interested in that part of the business. So I agree with that. And, and to Jesse's point, there's a part that's critical thinking, and then there's a part that, again, checklists help. Checklists yeah, are definitely. Good. And so definitely. they may not be able to get you the right stairs contact, but at least it sparks in your mind, hey, let me call my boy. Who's right. the region? That, no, who's in charge right here? Who's in charge? Because mm -hmm. let me tell you, when you walk in there as a new educator, leader, supervisor, director, manager, you are on stage. And what we frequently see around the industry is two weeks of sitting there waiting for the play to start. And so you can't get off to any worse start than you go in there and go, hey, Sean, oh, I'm still waiting for them to give me my computer access. Oh, I can't <laughs> do this. I, I don't knew. Hey, man. So when you start on that list, it also signals to the facility that just hired you, oh, this guy ain't like the, the, the gal we had. This gal ain't like the, the guy we had because she sat there for a month not doing anything. And this Sean guy is like, I need access to the scrubs. I need to know the, the vendor contacts. Hey, who do I need to talk to in facilities? Because I need a water quality report. Um, I don't see any air and humidity monitor. All those things that you say, I don't know these names. I know the names at my own facility, but this checklist is reminding me of the stuff that a manager is responsible for the oversight of thunder. And if you stay there for two weeks and a month and a month and you haven't been in that EVS manager or director's office to say, how can we work together to get my department cleaner? Hey man, it's too late. You you just accepted it. You accepted it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You, hey man, you, you you've been here for four weeks. You I thought you, it was fine with you. So that checklist can help you get started. On simple things. Hey, I don't have access to my computer. Show me where the EBS office is. Hey, how you doing? I was looking at my department and man, the cleaner. So those are the kind of things that can be jump started by your succession plan list that you make for your old place that you can take to your new place. All right. Let's Agreed. kill that one. Let's kill that one. Let's kill that one. So let's go into <laughs> another topic, right? I know Jesse has been, you know, had a couple of videos on this. I know Sean's been talking about this for a while. So let's talk about productivity. So how do you measure it? Is it a real thing? Should you be measuring it? And um, what's productive? Um, what do you expect out of your travelers in terms of productivity also? So guys, what do you I'm think? I'm on touch of the traveler, sorry. <laughs> 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 so. it, it, this productivity is always, always a hot topic and it's always good to talk about. Um, but it's it's never gonna to me it's never gonna find a solution. What what should it look like? I, I and I spoke about this in like in a couple of videos. Is it changes from facility to facility? It's like what do yes. you what is your what is your facility specializing in? What is your spe what is your, how's your facility um, managing their trays? Like what's the volume look like? What's the staffing model look like? All that plays in a factor into productivity. Um, I can tell you right now that if, if your staffing model is backwards or not in order, your productivity productivity is always going to look like you're not doing nothing. Regardless of how many trades each individual does and how that's measured, 
Um, I know that there's some uh, automation out there or uh, tracking systems, you know, that give you suggestions, you know, 12.5 seconds of inspection per instrument. Depends on what kind of quality you're putting into your instrument. If all I'm doing is looking for soil, then yeah. But if I'm doing, you know, lighted magnification, if I'm doing boroscopes, if I'm doing soil testing, if I'm tap testing, which rarely no one does, if you're <laughs> scissor testing everything, that 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 factors in big time. And the size of your tray, one instrument versus 150. And what does that one instrument look like? If it's a flexible scope, how long should you be spending inspecting that before you bag it up or box it up or whatever? So productivity is one of those things that is a very subjective matter. Um, I don't think anybody can ever come to a solid agreement because as we move forward, all we talk about is implementing more innovation, more technology, more uh, uh, AI into it. And that takes time. That learning curve, I can tell you from the receiving end of automation, that lear learning curve is vicious. Vicious. <laughs> I mean, even the 3D printed models, and the implants that are so sensitive, you can't wash it, you can't drop it, you can't hit it without the metal table, you know. And so that came up on a conversation just recently that I've had, you know, how do you weight your trays? Uh, you know, a general miner and a small ortho have the same amount of instruments. The small ortho has more inspection points, more testing to be done. So how can you weight that versus a general miner with the same 50-some instruments? I I'm just using some quick numbers, man. Come on, I can't go higher from fifty, you know. Yeah, oh, look, man, let me tell you something. Got, our, our general miners got seventy six instruments yeah. in it, bro. Yeah. <laughs> you know? but, but I mean like if you look at are you are you counting pill pouches from your clinics? You know, every ten pill pouches, does that count for one tray for your staff? Are you talking about um running up to the OR, taking the OR case cart to the room? Bring in, if you have to, bring an OR dirty case down to decontamination. Can you count that as, as a weight or, a, you know, you, productivity? You and you should. You definitely can. You definitely can. But how yeah, do you weight the tr So the biggest issue is how do you weight the trays? But right. yeah, I think yeah, it comes, yeah, yeah. as you yeah, said, yeah, it comes I, down to the location. You know, me traveling to 40-some locations I oversee, not every hospital has the same amount of volume, staffing level, and... and their volume every day. Uh, some Maybe. hospitals, you know, you know, I'll, I'll call out my buddy Shane from um, from HSPA, my mentee. You know, he had a department that did, I think, 30 cases a day, if I recall it right, and his staffing was three people. Maybe it was two, two or three people, and they had 30 to 40 wow. cases a day. Wow. And they, they, they had it down pat, and, you know, I oversee a hospital that does the same amount of work with eight to ten people. Yeah. So he, he was blown away, and and, and that was the and what, that was I guess one of the questions I raised. If you walk into a department, let's say just outside eyes, I walk into your apartment, and I see three hundred trays on a shelf. How many employees should be in there doing assembly? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a good question. You know, I, I guess about the tracking system. You know, that I posted for the day. I, I think the tracking software is really falling short on. Um, making people do set trays for the next day or same day surgeries, and they can just go free will us and just grab what they want to. So, sure, a team leader, supervisor could say, "Hey, here's a cart. You do that. You do that." But once they're done with those eight, ten trays, what are so, they going to do on easy trays? They know. If, uh, first of all, you need to you need to find out. Hey, how, 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 is the work getting done before you start measuring anything? Is the work getting done at the end of the day? Now, if it's not getting done, you have stuff left over. So that's stuff that's not getting done. How many trays not getting done for a night? Also, if you, when you find that out, then you, you look at your staffing. So, I, so if everything gets done, what, who did what? But see so that you, that's the, but see, I think that's the problem with the with the with the whole productivity question. Okay, what if we do? What if we process? every instrument that's required for the first for all the cases for the next day and you still have 300 instruments on the shelf <laughs> the work's getting done right mm -hmm. but is it getting done because what's happening with them with those trays that are sitting on the shelf what are we doing with them what are, are we just saying hey 
I don't care about those as long as my cases for the next day are done. Right. That's the problem with that staffing model. As the longer those instruments stay on the shelf, the more time those instruments go missing, they become damaged. Um, you know, nothing comes out of the dryer bone dry. So now you're talking about it's sitting there collecting dust because dust is daily. So how long do they sit on the shelf? What does that stand for? I've been using I've been using the argument you brought up and you didn't even know the gym you said. The items out of the, the washer are high level disinfected, not not sterile. So when we know what binary fission every 19.8 eight minutes we're doubling at Correct. some point a, a, a tray on the shelf might have a higher microbial count than a tray back in beacon you you are absolutely right and, and that so, and that's where the pro and that's where the problem comes in at no one's looking at that everyone's saying that came out the washer is clean but they're not thinking about how long does that tray sit on the shelf and should we be staffing to get rid of that Everywhere I've been to, and I might be wrong, but facilities are, are organized. Facilities are organized in a way where first shift caters to the OR, second shift is working on your, you know, case carts and cases for the day, trying to clean up the influx of instruments that come down from the OR and decon. So that's the working crew, and then third shift should be technically the cleanup crew. The things that were missed, missing instruments, and knocking out those instruments that are sitting on the shelf that aren't need for aren't needed for cases. So that first shift doesn't have to run around and get that, oh, where's that tray at um, that we got for add-on? Oh, well, it's sitting on the shelf. Right. Well, if we cleaned yeah, it up, it should have been sitting remember, on that shelf. You ask OR to, to remember anything, they'll say, you mean that tray we used Tuesday at, at 222? <laughs> they, they can get that time right. Yeah, uh, and, and Angie, my girl, she said, "Yeah, they had to they had to be washed again in her opinion, right?" But here's the problem: do do places with three hundred trays behind really do the best practices? Let's keep it real here. No, and, no. Let me Come tell on. you, I, I might I might have to put on my Jesse mask here for a second. <laughs> I know I have an unpopular opinion about. And I know there's a bunch of people who never. Hold on, had hold on. This is gonna be this is gonna be a TikTok clip. So let's go. <laughs> let's go. Uh, listen, they got an old saying in sports. If you keep listening to the fans, you're gonna be sitting up there with them for coaches. The product, this whole productivity at, uh, argument, is an argument that's from the level of the people who don't have to answer when trades are not ready for cases. We have to go upstairs and explain why the trade from last Thursday is not ready for cases. They don't. We have to start polishing up our resume on Indeed because we can't get our productivity up because the, the, the pick lists are terrible. When you say, oh, we got the trades done for, for, for tomorrow. You got most of the trades done for tomorrow. You ain't got all the trades done for tomorrow because they ain't on the pick sheet. So to say low productivity is no risk. When I see these arguments on the internet, I would rather do 10 trays perfectly than have a mistake in 40 trays. Let me tell you something. I don't care what your staffing model is. There ain't no staffing model built for 10 trays a day. All right? So I don't care. When I look at productivity, I'm looking at everything, right? What's the productivity in decon? What's the productivity of the people pulling cases? How long does it take us to get the stuff to sterile storage? We can, you can, you can mark all of that stuff. So whatever they're saying is distracting them from producing sterile trays, which is our job. Then we, then we can remove those and give them credit for those things. But at the end, this productivity argument is not an argument for anybody responsible for oversight in departments. There's a bunch of, we talk about the instrument tracking system. We can talk about all the things that get it interrupt productivity. But what is a universal truth, if your department is not productive, you will be working elsewhere. But the people who are not being productive, they will continue to get, get there when a new hard charge manager comes in. And the problem is there's no accountability for production. So it's not about trays, tray size. There's a million. We, I could give a whole lecture about how to use the Amy uh, uh, complexity categories to rate your trays and start from there. But the ultimate thing is, 
if you're not if, if you're saying we're going to take a laissez-faire leadership style towards productivity you're going to be taking a, a laissez-faire leadership style on your computer searching for a new job because i can tell you as somebody coming from the or a search tech and a first assistant i need my trays to be assembled perfectly and i need them to be neat but i also need the trays that i need for today so if you telling me that either i have to pick between both one or the other i there's measures we learn in search tech school that we should be expecting the trades before we put them on the on the field anyway but if the trades here's are that one that is a bigger risk than the people on the side of this productivity argument like to acknowledge because they don't have to deal with the operations and accountability part but those of us who have sat in that seat those of us who have been in the or i'm telling you you the, this these perfect trades that you have ready for the first case or first and second case when i have to flip a case or when this case gets canceled i need the third case ready those are just as killer as the the trades without an indicator so, so what do you think about the turnover times you think the or has too much pressure from the surgeons schedulers on their five minute turnover times between cases uh you, you got to be working on asc to have those that low you, now you well, just the part that I love. but yes the or the, the the toxic culture that we have in surgical services comes straight from the top i want to do more cases to make more money i need to, to do more cases i need to do more uh to need a shorter turnover to have shorter turnovers i may have to use trays over and over again i'm not making more money when i'm buying instruments but is my manager strong enough to bring me the data that shows hey we need more of these trays. Hey, we need these. Hey, we need these pick lists accurate. Here's the list of trays that we had to send up that weren't on the pick list. So it, 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 it's, it's, it, the responsibility rests with us, but we need our team to understand that productivity is important. And when you take that culture off, every mistake you make is, is another step that you get fired instead of an education opportunity, then, then that's when you, if you take that kind of pressure People do trades slow because they don't want to get in trouble. Mm -hmm. But when people do trades slow, the people who are responsible for the production get in trouble. So we have to find a way that we both can prosper. And it's not saying you do 30 trades a day or else, right? But like Sarah is saying, that's a, this myth that you have to choose between quality and quantity is not true. Are you trying to slim your trades down? Like apparently Sean has done with these 55 uh, <laughs> there's ways that you can get more productivity by looking at stuff that you don't need are you looking at stuff like if, are you telling your people at decon tell me every time a tray comes down and it's obviously unused well then mm -hmm. i i'm gonna take that tray and say yeah take this tray off uh off off the, the pick list oh why would you do that I, here's the data it being, it's called for 10 times, only use eight times. We can't yep. afford to reprocess those trades. I, I've done that that study, and it, was, it wasn't it was fun. But it's again, not, it's not fun, or is it But easy? if you can pull it off the pick ticket, you put it on the shelf, that's five more trades you have throughout yep. an eight-hour day or 10-hour yep. day. Yep. So I get off my soapbox now. But I, I, I know a lot of people out there are like, why productivity is bad? And a lot of people who have responsibility for the oversight or have that OR experience are, are like, you don't realize the risk that like Jesse said of 300 trays being down every day because we know those pick lists are not accurate enough to say we got all the work done. We didn't. All the work done is all the work done. I can't stand when, when the OR has to write on the pick ticket to justify what's being used for the next day. Mm. Just take the time and, wow. and fix your fix your pick ticket. Instead of sitting in the front desk or having a two hour conversation, you know, not saying they do it all the time, but spend an hour and fix your pick tickets. Update yeah. them. Yeah. Help us out. And that sounds like a uh, that's always sounds like a really good solution and, and that's and, and and it is the solution. But the problem is, is that things been messed up and stalled processing for so long <laughs> that when you try to sit there and even try to fix it, like even with walking into different facilities and just seeing the volume of instruments and trays, 
trying to get that volume down in those trays, it's like pulling teeth because you gotta it is. It talk is. to the directors, talk to the to the OR, talk to the surgeon, talk to such and such, talk to purchasing, and to try to reduce just five or six instruments. You're like, what? Well, that's pointless. I'm trying to get this instrument from this tray from 100 instruments down to like 25 because I'm seeing that you're only using 10 instruments out of the damn thing. Well, the, so just, that, that remember, becomes the biggest problem there. And then pick sheets. You got somebody who has to sit there behind a computer all day long and just grind out data that, again, they have to talk to such and such and such and such and such and such. And some of them surgeons don't even have a clue what the hell's getting picked for their cases. So, so that becomes program, a program. There was a program out at one time. Um, don't know who made it. I'm not going to say any names, but it's one of the orthopedic companies um, that they used to sell where they would pull in your pick tickets, pull in the trays. They would sit there and they would upload their tray, the instruments in that tray set. So they would pull Dr. Joe's minor tray, uh, a central tray, and open and close tray, right? All the instruments we uploaded, he would have that. They would have that doctor do uh, a gallbladder, then do it, you know, anything else, uh, lap happy, whatever. We're well, not lap happy. We know what I mean. Do all this procedure this doctor would do, and they would pull in Doctor uh, Doctor Smith. They would do all his cases with the same exact trays. At the end of that time frame, they would go through the instruments that, that doctor doctors would use, and say, "Hey, you only used." 15 out of the 50 instruments, we can reduce this in half from 50 to 40, maybe 35, and you would still have all your instruments that you would have to do all your procedures and anything for a trauma-related that would pop up. Because they actually had the option to do the trauma too. Have the unique a vein or the bone shatters. They would have that program into the, into the program. So that actually helped out at one location. Now, where that program went to, or is it still up and running? I have no idea, but that was a great program. Yeah, that, that, I mean, I, I know a few places that do that, that you know, analyze your trays and look at what the surgeons are doing and help reduce it. But again, if you're in a facility that has 5,000 trays, oh, yeah. <laughs> good luck with that. Yeah. <laughs> you so know, you, you, good luck with that. Do you guys because have experience? I'm, I'm gonna because, and quite honestly, I'm going to be honest, if you're going into a facility that has that many trays, I guarantee. 4,000 of those trades have way too many instruments in it. <laughs> All right, so, do, you, do you have you guys had experience with backup cards? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. do, do you like yeah. it? Is, is it a good idea just in case? It has to be locked. It has to be Wait, checked what was that? Times. Backup cards. Like, you know, auto backup, uh, you know, not trauma cards, but a backup just in case something. Oh, backup happens. for non trauma cases? Oh, non trauma? Yeah. No. Oh man, you must have a lot of room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. If it's if it ain't trauma or like uh, what you mm -hmm. call the the backup, no. I yeah. mean, granted, it's again, it's like with a, a lot of the you got to figure most of the cases that you use are using general general trays for the majority of the trays. It's, it's every other tray after that is basically a slight modification. Difference between a general minor and a rectal tray. It's just the retractors in there. So it, 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 it kind of blows my mind when I see trays and they, they're picked for the same case. And I'm like, those are all the same damn instruments in there. Why can't we just make a tray for the rectal set that just has the retractors in it? you got everything else in the basic. So what's the problem? And it's like always a pushback and it's crazy. And then you wonder why productivity is so bad. So the funny part yeah. is I was at a hospital. They had an IND tray made by the OR to do, you know, IND cases, 10 instruments. They always wanted a general minor or a plastic tray, which was like 300 instruments because it, what if ha this happens and this happens? I'm like, it's, it's an IND. Uh, if you need something else, call us, but all you need to do is make an incision, drain out the wound, close it back up, and away with your day. Do you really need all those extra instruments to do that case? Well... What I can tell you, Sean, is from the OR perspective, why should I take a chance on doing that? And if if they ask for that one time in band camp and they, they, they don't have it. No, and I so understand. That, that, that's really what you're fighting when you're fighting the, instru the, the, the instrument monster, right? Because 
the, what what we consider a tray is the product of decades of surgeons adding their stuff in there. Well, can you add a this in it? Well, that surgeon is not even practicing there anymore. Who who we added this and that in there for? And so, um, and, and it's a hard thing. And that's where if you can get your staff and productivity up, you can have the time to go up and start start with your biggest ten, your your busiest ten cases. And you can go up there and do the observation yourself. Watch a case. Use a laser pointer. Okay, they use this. They use that. They use that. And now, I'm not advocating that anybody does this. But. <laughs> We're going to do it. No. <laughs> if there's a, if it's a non-countable case, right? Not countable case. They got eight crowds on there. And you go up and observe four cases. And they never use more than two. That next count sheet might come out with six. On it. It's with six. I'm down to five. And, yeah, and so that, that, when you start looking at, but really partnering, you know who can do it in a flash? The confident surgical techs. The surgical techs at your the, uh, at your facility, they're not scared like the, the the service line nurse, right? And there's no knock on nurses. I love nurses. That's not a attack nurses, but the nurses are like, if I make this change, it might come back on me. Yeah, exactly. Get, that's all about mm -hmm. this. That's what I was about to say too. It's not even that the surgeons wanting it. Is that sometimes the circulating nurses don't want to be going back and forth? Yeah, they don't. They like, don't want to take that chance. But if you can find you a shine of a surge tech, people like, oh man, they don't use that. They don't use that. Man, no, they never. Oh, that's from when Doctor Lopez used to be here. Yeah, you can take that out. <laughs> now, you make sure if. Whatever you take out, if you don't have a slot in the pill pack for it, make one because it's worth it, right? You take this stuff out, and then it's easy. If you can find a shine, the shine would be like, yeah, I said take it out. Yeah, yeah, I said take all that crap out of there. And then you can start moving on because if you do enough of them, then you can say, well, hell, if he said I can do that for the ortho major, certainly I could do it. Do, similar things to the ortho minor and then they'll, they'll, they'll say well who took this out of here no sean remember when sean did that but anyway i'm not giving you ways to 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 fight the man and so, so oh yeah but i'm i'm saying that um if you're if you're banking on uh a, a service line coordinator and there's some service line coordinators who'd be the, leading the charge right especially the accountable ones See, the accountable ones, they're on your side. They're like, yeah, let's get some of this stuff out of here. So leverage those relationships. No, in the in the non-countable services, you got to get a strong tech, our first assistant. In the countable, hey, man, they want to get that stuff out of there too because they got to count it every time. So take advantage. Leverage those relationships. And bringing it full circle, that's uh, something you could add in your succession planning too, the go-to persons. True. True Instead point. of going all the way through the director, there's a surgical tech you could go to that would get this right. done in, in in a few weeks versus sending 20 emails and trying to figure out, you know, when you're going to sit down with the surgeon to actually work on those trees when he doesn't even know what's in the trees exactly. Yeah, that, I mean, that that is one of the most cowardice ways to do it, right? And sometimes <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll find, you know, I'm blunt, you know, I'm blunt. <laughs> Without being insulting, but sometimes you'll find surgeons who are like with uh, Hank, Hank, and Hank and those guys. They ran across. Uh, um, hey, what's going on, Sean? Um, but you know they'll they'll run across uh, your know, occasional surgeon who's like, yeah, I'm I'm with that. What what you really work on with your surgeons is it ain't no way we need 14 trays and you and and tell get the surgeon to to pressure the vendor reps to make that into a two tray, three tray uh, thing. That can be done. And that's just as valuable as working on uh, uh, a knee tray or whatever, because yeah, the knee tray has too many instruments on it, but those 14 trays they bring in to do the total knee, that's where the opportunity is. You know, you know, you know what's funny though? On a mission trip I go to, they do a total knee with Two trays for the uh, the vendor side. Yeah. For a total hip, four tray. No, three trays. I've That's seen that. it. I've seen that. And I'm yeah. like, wait, why? Why can't we do back back on the state side? Like, why? 
and they had the same care. They jam everything in those trays. They had a little heavier. I understand that, um, you know. But why can't our vendors back home, stateside around us, say, hey, we only need these three trays? So actually, I had that happen. They would bring in uh, 12 trays for uh, a case, and then I'm like, why are you bringing in 12 trays? We have these other five trays here. You only need four trays for your procedure. What about the other three trays? Oh, those are just backups to backups. I'm like, I'm out sterilizing them. So after about two years of working with the guys and, and the team up in the OR downstairs, they were, they were bringing the trays, all, all 12, because it was a package deal, right? Mm-hmm. They were bringing the 12 trays. We'd push five to the side. We'd sterilize these three, and we'd sterilize these four. Um, but, yeah, I mean, j- just get involved. L- learn what actually is used. And then the ones you don't use, because they're just for, you know, possible trauma you actually have on your shelf, you don't even need them. And the funny yeah, part, that, I, that IND tray was designed by the surge techs at that facility, but the hospital didn't recognize it. Ah. Oh. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep, sir. All right, guys, it seems like you're ready for a break on another topic. Hmm. So let's get a little technical. Um, let's go into something we've all been. In fact, hold up one second. If you haven't already done it, guys, please go to the YouTube channel, like and subscribe, and also hit that notification bell so that you will be notified every time we have a new show coming up. All right, cool. That was our little promo. And um, let's go into another topic. <laughs> you like that, shot? I did. I like that. <laughs> so um, let's get into um, Dick and Tam. I like Dick and Tam. Um, we, we did um, Dawning and Dolphin PPE last show. So let's go into, um, and, 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 and I'm always taking it from Jesse. Oops, oops, oops. Who's that? Who's that? Hold on, hold on, hold on. All right, all right, Sean, you got a roll? Me? Yeah. Who's, oh, Jesse got a roll. Yeah, yeah and a few. Oh, just a few. Man. Don't worry about it. I got a few minutes. Damn it. Okay, cool. So, yeah, so um, so washers, right? I think just um, Jamid touched on a little bit of the washer. You know, after your trees come out the washer, the, you know, how long does it take, right? And I don't want to go into vendors. So, um, what's your process for putting? I, I think Jesse had a video on that years ago. I just yeah, I always watch your videos. You know, don't think I hate your videos. I like your videos. <laughs> so, um, what's your process from getting your tray through the case card? And and I know that you, you're not going to be exactly you know wood for wood and exactly what happens. But when you're getting your trays out of the case card to the washer. And I think Jesse and I had some debates on that too. Like, what what's a good process, like a general practice for that? Just to give some people some nuggets to take away from the show, because I know people are gonna come out there like, oh, that's that's not my level. I can't use that. So let, let's give the people some nuggets as to when you get those trays out of your case card or your table. Some places still have tables, um, rolling carts through the, to the gun, um, and getting it to the washer. What's your process? Soaking, um, disassembling. Um, do you put your do you put your instrumentation back together after you clean it, or do you put it through the washer disassembled? Do you well, put a um, one more? Do you put a, a, a what do you call it? Or do you put a, a knife handle between your run jaws? To go through the washer. Do you you know? Do you take apart the the, the springs of your run jaws and keep them open? Like you know, little tips and tricks or. Are those ideas that I, I, I put forth there, are those, are those bad ideas in terms of keeping stuff open? Or should you clean it and just put it through like that? Mm. No. Well, it all comes down, first of all, you should always follow your IFUs. That's automatically. But you also want to think about what is the proper process. Again, are you... Is your if you're going through the washer, then you're talking about manual preparation. You're not talking about manual cleaning anything. So if your OR is properly pre-treating everything, your first step should always be to rinse your instrumentation, regardless of what you have. You want to get that pre you want to get that pre-spray or that pre-treatment off of that instrumentation. So you're good, Jimmy. What's up? What's up? <laughs> I knew that. I knew it. That should be a first step, even if they're not pre-treating, because 
if you if you don't do a cold water rinse and you just take them and soak them now you created dirty water to clean them in right uh -huh. oh 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 uh, now now i'm gonna now i'm gonna reference amy st79 with their conflicting uh statement in there that uh we need to address amy st79 suggests that you should pre-soak and rinse prior to cleaning so pre-soaking and rinsing can only happen in decontamination so there should be two separate sinks for that prior to the three sink setup so if it's not pre-treated then you should be pre-soaking it to break down that soil to pre-rinse and then continue the cleaning process because if it's not pre-treated most likely that soil is going to be stuck on and you're going to be scrubbing forever just like you would at home if you're burning some rice on the bottom of that pot you can go ahead and put that elbow grease right off the back but if you pre-soak it it's going to be a lot easier you to mean, do it you mean you mean uh kong kong which i incorrectly call big out tom what, what was that i said you mean kong kong which i incorrectly well, call big out? it's called big out that kong kong is big out <laughs> get it right brother <laughs> don't start that but anyway <laughs> the whole <laughs> The whole process, if we're if we're if we're in in decon and you're gonna go through the washer, then what you're doing with your instrumentation is called manual preparation. You're you're first you're rinsing your instrumentation to remove all your pretreatment off of there and any visible soil that you can possibly see on there prior to the sorting of instruments. In your sorting of your instruments, all your instruments that can be in the open position should be open. Um, I'm a I'm a bit advocate that any sharps should lay flat in your in your tray rather than stand straight up. Um, even though straight up with your instruments is best practice, but I don't think that's best practice with with sharps. Anything that can be taken apart should be disassembled. Um, for all your rangers and and spring loaded instrumentation. There are special holders in that. I do not recommend using another instrument to jam in between, even though that is the norm that you see in a lot of stove processing is using a knife handle to jam in between instrumentation to keep it open. I don't recommend that because now you create shadowing for that instrumentation. So you should be using the special holders that you have to open those instruments open. The same configuration for your trays should uh, follow in decontamination that's in prep and pack. Your heavier instruments should be on top. Lighter instruments on the side, sharps should be visibly uh, visible within your tray, so off to the side. If your tray is configured that configured that it's so heavy, it should be split into two. So putting your heavier instruments into one basket with your lighter instruments in the other. Once you've sorted, you're going to give it another rinse to make sure that you didn't miss any instruments that were shadowed in there. If you see an instrument that's heavily soiled, then that instrument should be put on the top of that tray so that when your soaking process happens, then you can put a brush to it or a wipe it off under the surface of the water. Let the detergent do its work. Okay, because that's one thing that we miss in all of our practices in the manual cleaning or manual preparation is that we don't follow center circle. We don't let the detergent do its job. We think that it's a dip and keep it moving. That's not how that works. After you've done all that with your sorting and your soaking, you should give it an, another initial rinse. And that final rinse right there should always be with critical water, whether it be reverse osmosis or distilled, wa distilled water or deionized, whichever one your facility has. Now you have to determine, is it going to go into the ultrasonic and then into the washers? What most people don't look at when they're going into the ultrasonic is what's the mixture of instruments in there? If you have instruments in there that's titanium, that's coated, that has um, insulation, um, even tit uh, tungsten carbine inserts, and with regular stainless steel, you're going to have a problem going into the sonic because you're going to cause gavitation, which is going to cause staining on your instruments. So no one segregates trays like that. And when you're putting trays com configured together, no one really looks at that configuration either. Only all stainless steel instruments should be going into your ultrasonic your ultrasonics have limitations so when you look at that ifu you should be looking at that and then proceed to your washer disinfectors so i 
you know you don't do a great job and melinda brings up the right concentration of detergent and that that's that's incredibly important um this is this is your wheelhouse jesse i see your passion coming out one of the things that i'll add is i'll just chime in when it's administrative controls that can help one of the things that that people have a hard time being able to voice doing accreditation visits or audits when we come out is which things get sonic and which things don't and i i've seen different techniques to try to assign which things get sonic and which things don't and i i whenever i'm running the department i keep it simple all ortho neuro, neuro and lap stuff is going to get sonic and so when you make it simple like that then you make it achievable instead of saying is this tray i had a place that had print in, in 10 10 font 10.5 <laughs> all the trays to get sonic then and, and i was like wait you you just put an ortho tray with ron jurors right into the washer so when you talk about think about ultrasonic and whether you're a tech or the, the leader think about how can we make this as simple as possible to ensure that the stuff that needs to get sonic is sonic and that you're not sonic and stuff that doesn't need to get sonic because this is where i'll jump on my thing if you're sonic and general general trays there's something wrong with your washer buddy a general tray should be able to go through the process according to the ifus and through that washer and come out lickety split clean so if you're having a sonic trays with ribbon retractors and stuff like that we, we got you got some different problems or more than likely you're wasting time and prime sonic real estate doing trays because it's not clear to the staff the team or the facility what stuff is important to sonic and what stuff is not so what so what about on your end though so i agree that certain trays should not hit the sonic depending on what they are but what if you have surveyors that come in and say you must sonic every single tray that comes through your your decontamination room your policies detect that yeah as long exactly. as you can as long as you can speak to your policy your surveyors can say whatever the hell they want because they're not going to be able to override your policies yeah again with my with my take on sonicking you only put stainless steel through sonic everything else if you don't have the proper hookups in there we're not sonicking okay i have specific i have specific sonics just for da vinci arms okay we don't put that in a regular sonic with our regular instruments in there our sonic is separate for that if you're doing eye instruments you need to have a dedicated eye instrument sonic yep. that's dedicated so, but all of my trays that have mixed instruments, if and even even my vendor trays, if I have silicone holders in there, rubber, and it's coated, it's not going through the Sonic. I refuse to throw it through the Sonic because you're not going to get the you're not going to get the job. Right. And well, that's a whole different subject that we can have. We can talk a whole hour for those uh, vendor trays. Should, those vendor trays should even be going through the Sonic. Only the instruments should. But they're so, in the IFU on some of them. Sonic what was is that? the last thing before the washer, correct? Or are you well, that, doing I'm rent, Are you rinsing? Sonic so, is the last thing before the washer, or are you rinsing after the Sonic? So it depends. Sonic. If, if if my Sonic if my Sonic has a rinse cycle, then no. If my Sonic is a still bath Sonic, then yes, you rinse mm -hmm. before going into the Sonic. Yep. Hold, hold on, 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 because because I, I I'm confused because <laughs> my knowledge of how washer disinfectors work uh uh make me raise the flag on that because of this come What's on, the come first on. Thing that's gonna happen when you put that tray inside the wash rinse a utility water rinse yep so, but 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 hold on i'm gonna stop you but because the chemistry in your sonic is different from the chemistry in your washer disinfector the foaming action that can happen during that rinse can cause your washer to fail because there'll be too much air into that uh, into that uh, motor. Correct. We had a Where, huge. What in the world are you putting in your Sonic? Oh uh, no, no, sir. Let me tell you something. I, I had a huge issue with a facility I worked at where we had still bath Sonics and we were throwing oh. our tray straight through because they were saying that same thing. Oh, we got a first rinse and we were getting failures in our washers like crazy and we couldn't figure it out until a seasoned technician uh, uh, mechanic came in that, that worked for that company and was like, are you rinsing your trays because there's a lot of air 
getting circulated through the motor, causing a failure. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. I haven't seen that in years. I think that's what I have already, that has been corrected. And, and, and I know they're manufacturing. Well, I mean, manufacturing. it doesn't help when you're putting Paul Mollick on an instrument. <laughs> yeah, that's true, too. You know, I can't, my Fabuloso don't do too good in the watches. <laughs> I, I do want to go back to, uh, to uh, I think her name is Amina. Mm-hmm. I might be saying it wrong. My apologies Amina, if I say it wrong. Amina, yeah. yeah. So I, uh, my yeah, facilities, we use the Striker Blue 62 and also the new Striker wand that you know you saw probably at the last two conferences for HSPA. Uh, we utilize those in our for facilities. Have had good luck with them. Uh, in the past, I've also used some of the Steris products too, but we kind of changed to the Striker Avenue. Uh, so that's what we use and, and what, where I'm from. What are we talking about for pre-treatment? Yeah, pre-treatment up in the OR. Uh, so I you- don't believe in pre-treating before you get to decontam. I believe you should. Like, if you're treating in decontam, that's too late. Yeah. The OR needs to be treating um, when the patient leaves the room or when they take it to the dirty, soiled room down to the elevator. They yeah. Just it, in there. Too late. It, 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 it becomes too late, Sean. It becomes yeah. too late. When so you here, 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 here's the thing that people get wrong about pretreatment, too, and this is, this is where another uh, problem, I believe, with pretreatment comes in at. People think that pre-treatment, and that's why I, I highly, I, I like that ST91 changed that verbiage. We're not, the, the, the OR isn't cleaning instruments. They're keeping the soil moist. Mm-hmm. Now, during the case, a surge tech will always remove gross soil off of the instrumentation. That's part of his duty. Yeah, you know, right. you go ahead, you go ahead and give a dirty instrument back to a surgeon and it's going to be an issue. So he's he's wiping down in between during the case. And even if there is gross soil left on the instrumentation, if that gross soil is kept moist, which is what most pre-treatments should be doing, we shouldn't have an issue in decon. All that having enzymatic in the pre-treatment and all this and extra, all that is to help break down the soils. But if we're keeping it moist, we shouldn't have an issue. That's well, why the option of having a more style. That could, be a, that could be a patient safety issue too, right? Spraying, spraying. Patient better be out the at, room. In, into the into the room, and then no. when you talk about, well, we wait till the patient get out the room. Well, then it ain't gonna get done. Yeah, so, it, it ain't gonna get done if the patient leaves. Yep, you're right. Yeah. So, uh, but the other thing that I would add to that process is, where are you rating the point of use care of the OR? Because if you're not, that is a key data point. Listen, when you take pictures of the bloody acetabular reamer and you send it to me, and then I send it to the director, you know what the director of surgical services is thinking? Oh, we had 78 cases and I only got one picture. That ain't bad. You need to rate each tray individually, whether you have an instrument tracking system or not. And if you don't have an instrument tracking system, don't write the ones down that came down good. Just write the case card numbers down that come down bad. But to me, we don't have numbers in our case card. Okay, that's a project. The reason you want to have numbers on your case card is so you can do this. But we don't. they don't scan to the room. Ah, let's add barcode so they can scan to the room. All of these things help you. Because when you start talking about, well, bio burn, I always start off with, there's no blood and bone down here, right? So it, it didn't come from down here. We got to do a better job on our side. But here's the numbers for today. Here's the numbers for this week. So that you stop relying on terrible pictures to scare the OR to do it. They ain't going to do it. You know what's going to make them do it? Ortho, this week, 52% of the trades were bad. That'll make them stop doing it because data is key. And so if you're not rating those trades when they come down, you can't, you, you can't just expect, even if you go up the huddle or whatever you do, that's not going to change it. What's going to change it is room uh, case number eight from ortho room seven, terrible. And, and so, my soapbox on that. that. That's how important that is. And, and, and the, the other issue in decon that, that we need to address also is that with our washer disinfector, I know that our racks, you know, some of our racks can hold nine instruments, uh, nine instrument trays. But do we necessarily need to put all nine? To? Do, do we, we have do we to, have to put all nine in there? That's a, no. that's a good point. That's a good point. Yep, what, that, what, about the 12? what about the 12, the 40 racks? Uh, no, it, it, again, no, it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't, it, 
again, I think that when you, it's same thing with our dishwashers at home. And I know people hate when I try to uh, uh, correlate with what we do at home or what we do in, mm-hmm. in, in, stale pro- in stale processing. But it's the same thing. If you overload your dishwasher at home, you're going to come out with dirty dishes. You overload your washers or maximize it every single time, even though it was rated to do maximum. It wasn't validated with a maximum load. It was validated with one set through there. Just like when we validate our cleaning process, it validates one instrument, not an instrument set. But so what, you can base it on testing? that. What about your washer testing? Your washer testing is basically saying you can put something on every shelf and come out perfectly fine. One test on each shelf. Right. That's not a that again. That's not a good indication. Twelve trays. Yeah. Yeah. Let's put let's put twelve let's put twelve trays on there with indicators in there that's and what see the if every says. single that's and see if every says. one of them pass and and let's 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 stir it up with that one. Those are worst case scenarios. So let's put all dirty instruments into our washers and see if they're going to come out clean like those washer tests. Guarantee you'll be sending them back. Guarantee. I'm running, I'm running twelve washer tests tomorrow. I go to a hospital. <laughs> <laughs> Guarantee. That's half you. That's half you. <laughs> Guarantee. And before I leave, I will answer Amina's question. Pre-treatment with enzymatic or non-enzymatic, it doesn't matter as long as that soil, in my opinion, doesn't matter as long as that soil is kept moist. It mm-hmm. prevents it from sticking, for- forming that bio burden, and can rinse off easily. And no foaming or low foaming. And low foaming. Yes. I thought yeah, pre-treatment I, in, at its core was to remove gross soil from the instrument. Yep. I, 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 initially, I don't think it's to clean the instrument. I think yep. the excess, like, the, I mean, you're going to get some red on it. You're going to get some pigmentation. Yes, definitely. On the yeah. stuff. But to remove the soil, okay, like they, they, they cut up. They cut somebody's intestines up into 20 little pieces and you get a one piece coming down stuck in a in a curette or something um, just to you know um yeah. that's supposed the, the, to be taken out like that's definitely. what i think pre-treatment is the goal i mean the goal is to get an instrument set down there that we can easily clean i mean we don't want to see the acetabular reamers with a whole bunch of ground beef in there right. you know exactly. it, it, it can have the, it can have some but we don't we don't want it packed with it you know because it makes it difficult to clean so the pre-treatment and again even with that scenario you can pre-treat that all you want. It's still going to be difficult, you know? Yeah, right. And I do agree on uh, Linda's statement right there. You know, it does depend on the test. Um, I'm sorry to say it, but some of the tests out there in our world are not uh, truly are not challenging. testing, are challenging not challenging. our machines. Are not challenging. And then how, are there, how, are, how, are, there, how are there no... Um, you know, there's only like one or two companies that test for, you know, lumens or, you know, sonication. How, how are we not pushing back to the manufacturers? Like, how do you test sonication? How do you test that the, the, uh, your, your channels are pushing fluid through it and enzymatic solution? But it's again, and again, those tests that, you know, we consider, you know, testing our washers and stuff like that, it depends on the test. I mean, because if you think about, you know, one of the popular ones, I'm not going to name drop, you know, their IFU says that, you know, you can put whatever chemical in there and you should be able to pass it. But in essence, if you do use a specific um, detergent, you know, that does not have enzymatic in it, you can't pass that test no matter what. No matter what, what so how are you I... supposed to clean? So how are you supposed to clean those eye instruments that can't use enzymatic? How do you? What test is out there to show you that you can pass, you know, or properly clean an eye instrument if that challenging test can't be passed with a non-enzymatic detergent? So Jesse, this, someone this I met at HSPA. So someone I met and we had a discussion about eye instruments. I forget who it was. They had a study that showed. I know you got to go, so I'll be quick. Um, that they used enzymatic solution on their eye instruments, and they showed with proper rinsing of the instruments that they did not show any uh, correlation with TAS or nothing. So in, in five years, they had no TAS, no issues that is, using and enzymatic. That is definitely the key. If you look at the two big major eye instrument companies out there, IFU, Guess what detergent they use to clean their instruments? Enzymatic. 
Enzymatic <laughs> Using enzymatic to clean TA to use to clean ophthalmic instruments does not cause TASS. It's proper improper rinsing, rinsing mm -hmm. of the detergent that causes it. If you mm -hmm. properly rinse your instruments, you will not have any issues whatsoever. Well, and, and with that, and with that, guys, right. it was real. I got to go. All right. Peace, Jesse. Peace. <laughs> See you in the next one, yeah. part three. <laughs> um. So. But it's not just it, it really the real secret is there's this viscous stuff that we use upstairs in eye surgery, right? And if you don't rinse that off, it doesn't matter whether you use enzymatic, don't use enzymatic. So and a lot of people say, well, we don't we're not gonna sonic the our eye trays because we don't have a, a, a dedicated sonic to, to use to put it in. And I would say Get one. There's a Sonic somewhere sitting in your warehouse. Grab that one and make that into your eye, because I'm telling you, some of that stuff and the lumen sizes, you gotta Sonic it to get that stuff out of it, so that it won't grab onto whatever enzymatic that you have. Uh, Melinda's making some great points. Amina's making some great points. Um, enzymatic. I'm I'm not anti enzymatic. It's just making sure that you understand what you're buying into with the enzymatic, right? Because the problem is 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 biofilm. That the the rusting and pitting is because of the delay between the case ending and it getting into contact with something. So the enzymatic is not going to buy you extra time, make it okay for you to have one person in decon when you got 20 case cards back there. Those are the real villains that we don't want to talk about. The, the cause of rusting and pitting is because we won't send another person to decon. Not whether I do enzymatic versus uh, uh, surfactant-based uh, pretreatment. I, both of them work. Um, they, you're talking about two different uh, cost points. You're talking about two different times when you're allowed to spray it. And how does that affect compliance? So those are the factors that you take into consideration when you choose one or the other. I don't have stock in either one of them. Both of them help prevent the formation of biofilm, which is ultimately the leading cause of rusting and pitting. So good question, Amin. We got quiet there. What, what is that? <laughs> I'm oh, sorry, sorry. sorry. I was on mute. I didn't want to interrupt uh, Jameed. So, uh, I mean, I had a question about uh, uh, um, so you staying in the enzymatic soap. Um, what do you guys think about that? I, I, I try not to give my opinions on certain things. <laughs> so, I would say, no. I, 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 so, my thing is know, chemistry. I mean, Back to chemistry. Yeah. Can you make the two things? You have a good relationship. We'll talk about that offline. Let's talk about that offline. But I but I, I do have to say there are some some things that aren't written that do work. So don't get um, me started on that. Denard, <laughs> let's say that for the next Denard. meeting. Let's, let's call. Let's call. That's, that's, that's next meeting. That's everything yeah. that's everything that's not written doesn't mean it doesn't work. All right, not because not nobody wrote an article oh. about it or put it in uh, <laughs> you know in a certain book. Doesn't mean it's not good. Ah, uh, yeah, no, no. I, I, I don't like to comment on specific products, but we all know there's some some stuff that's off the books that, um, especially when you're in challenging situations, when you got hard water, when you got small sinks, you got, you know, like when you're, some of the times when you're looking at, thou shalt do this best practice. Right. And you're like, this place ain't best practice. I can't. <laughs> I, I can't. I mean, I, you want me to? So I, I, I think that yeah, I, yeah. We we know that 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 human beings are nothing more than ingenious inventors, and I can't tell you how many tricks that I've learned. And I, I would have to go down and write down all my tricks of the trade. Yes, please. Um, and then. Scratch out the ones that I can't say why, <laughs> and then figure out which ones are not a violation. But um, Amina, Amina, I this is this is not the first time I've seen uh, that combination. 
And um, yeah, I, I'll just leave. Let's my leave that there. Let's leave that there. Let's I'll leave, leave that. There. <laughs> <laughs> Let's leave that there. So guys, it's uh, been an hour and a half. I really appreciate you guys coming on. Um, hey man, it's show. always great to have have like a, a like a little outback kind of locker room chat kind of that that stuff that we can't say out on the floor we can't say but that's where the real stuff is man so yeah. you do a great job of facilitating facilitating that and i i love coming i'm on here to fight for justice against sean and jesse <laughs> <laughs> and i i try to stay out of it because i know if i go left everybody's gonna be like oh he's all the way left so i try to stay in the middle I try and stay in the middle. So, um, but thank you guys. Appreciate it. Uh, let me see. Let me let me get my outro together before I say we go. If we go in, <laughs> so um, Sean, anything you want to promote on your end? No, sir. I lost the beard. New oh, man. Yeah. I see. I see that. No, that's a new guy. I don't. I don't think that's Sean. That's Sean's brother. Yeah, that's <laughs> Sean's brother. Um, Guatemala. Here I come in like three weeks. So th three weeks. Yeah. And did you get your, you you were trying to get something for Guatemala? What are you I trying got the, to get? I got the full amount, man. So thank you for all my supporters out there and all the donations. I appreciate you all. And, you know, the beard came off. So it's, this, this, is about, this is about two weeks right now. So that's a back. great thing you're doing. That's your two weeks. The NART, that's like two and a half years for yeah, you. Yeah, that's like two years. I've been growing this since January. <laughs> Damn. Oh. Hey, look, we're gonna we're gonna make a man's beard cover coming up soon. A man's beard cover is coming we, we out. We got to. We got to. We got to. Uh, Medline, hit me up. I'm ready to go. And um, uh, uh, Mr. Billingsley, what you have going on in your end? Uh, Friday, um, Saturday, I will be at the Florida Fire Chapter. Shout out to the Pacific West uh, SPA. Was just there that week last weekend with some great speakers in Long Beach. Great weather. It wasn't as hot as it was in the rest of the West Coast. Uh, but Florida, we'll be at Florida. Dave Dragrosi will be at Florida. Sharon Green Golden will be at Florida. Lorraine Durigan will be at Florida. Oh, wow. Our hitter will be at Florida. Wow. If you're not at Florida, where are you? On the and beach. it's still not too in late. <laughs> it's still not too late. And what a great excuse to to drive down for the weekend, take a little vacation, and and and, and go to one of the Disney Worlds or Sea World or, or something like that. Yeah, come on down for a quick little thing. Flights are that, cheap. That's not a quick drive, man. That's like a 14, 16 hour drive for me. I was, but just let Greyhound do it. It might take thirty hours to get down there, and thirty <laughs> hours to get back. But you could be working on you could be working on projects on the. They have Wi Fi on the buses now. <laughs> So, come on down. Let's have fun. Tell me some other stuff I need to attack Denard on and Sean, and we'll bring it back to the show. So I was um, actually thinking of going down there, you know, on a low, but I don't know. I might do it. You might see me. You might not. So I'll, uh, we'll, we'll see. We'll see in a couple of days what's, what, you know, what I said. Oh, man, we got, the, we got the next president of the, of the PWSPA, Damon Miles. Great guy, great guy. Yeah, yeah, I like that. Dude. I usually That's... don't like when guys are as tall or taller than me. <laughs> for Damon, he, he barely squeaks in there. But yeah, it was great, great fun at PWSA. And listen, guys, this is what I will say: keep an eye on that van. We got something big coming out. But go to your chapter meeting. Listen, you talking about succession plans and and tips and tricks and 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 stuff. When you wonder how Denard got to be the, the, the president of, of HSPA, then when you wonder how Denard has 47 advertisement and your podcast only has one, there's a lot of stuff you can do online. Networking is not one of them. And it come in person. If you can't get to HSPA, get to your chapter meeting or the next state over. Chapter meetings still matter. Chapter meetings are important. And if you're wondering where your next step is, is you can you you can find it easier at that chapter meeting than you can on Indeed or any of these other career builders. So come back to chapter meetings. The yes, chapter please. You and you need the chapter. You need the network. Yes. So I must say everything Jamid said. He said on his own. I didn't influence him to say. <laughs> <laughs> so um, and one. Oh yeah. Let me let me go with my thing too. So 
Um, I, I might be going back to Jamaica in November, so um, I'm actually Woo-hoo! I'm actually on a mission trip, not a vacation. Okay, let me just clarify because people had Jamaica, they think you know you're going to cook. Uh, you know, I mean, you're going to um, Mobe on on uh, you know on the strip, but um. I'm, I'm I'm having a scrub drive, so there are a couple of the hospitals down there have zero. I don't want to say zero, but they're they they're, they're they're lacking in scrubs for the nurses, the doctors, um, etc. So I'm creating a scrub scrub drive for I think about three um, facilities down there. Um, and I'm going to be reaching out to some companies too. So um, I'm be, I'm not sure I'll make it official in a few weeks, but I'm having a scrub drive. If you guys have any use lightly used scrubs you want to donate um to the uh, facilities in jamaica please let me know we could work something out and get those scrubs down there so that the nurses doctors yeah. surgeons could have something to wear when they come in because as you could see in some of my old photos uh, there's some a couple of days i had to wait like an hour for a pair of scrubs or i had a 5x shirt and uh <laughs> I had a 5X shirt and a medium yeah. pants on. So it's like, you know, they really need the, the help. So um, I'm creating a scrub drive to, you know, help those guys have some stuff. To Listen, do. you guys have all those scrubs in your drawer at your house. You <laughs> have all those scrubs. You're a traveler, so you can't go back to Idaho to take them back. And you you, you, you got fired from this place, and then you got into a fight at this other place, so you, you banned from the premises. Man, give Denard these scrubs. You only you only need like three pairs. You don't need forty seven. Give Denard these scrubs. Yes, appreciate it, Jimmy. Thank you, thank you. And um, good night, Amina. Hey, good night, Amina. Good night, everybody. I'm, and um, guys, um, I'm ending the show now. But um, just wait down. We'll 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 um chop it up for a couple seconds. Um, so guys, thank you for watching. Peace. Have a good night, everybody. Or good day. Whenever you get to see this, make sure you like and subscribe and also follow the show. Um, Peace.